And while we're waiting for him, um, if anyone else wants to share kind of uh, the best advice they ever got about getting a CIHR grant and what was successful about it. And to start us off, I'll tell you that uh, Yusanda Busto, who was at CAMH a long time ago when I was uh, first starting out, told me to always send CIHR your very, very best idea because it's not like a disease-based place. You really have to convince them. You know, for me working in geriatric psychiatry, they don't necessarily, people don't necessarily care about the elderly. So you're competing with um, a lot of different, you know, groups. So they don't all have an interest in your area to begin with. So you have to make it really hot and really interesting. Uh, the other thing that I'll say is, um, grantsmanship really counts and making things just a little bit pretty and making it clear because if your uh, application, I also, I'm the scientific officer on behavioral sciences B and I've been on other different panels as well, as well as doing some of the uh, applications for uh, people trying to get uh, salary awards. If your um, application is just a little bit sloppy and doesn't have that attention to detail that you go through and make it perfect afterwards, then, you know, the comments around the table, you, people think that you're not taking the application seriously. And for my area with clinical trials, people wonder, you know, if you can't pay attention to detail, can you run a clinical trial? So those are some of the things that I've noticed around the table that are just general things that I've noticed. Uh, anything else we should say? Well, I think for know. me, some of the best advice was just to be as linear as possible. Like I think as researchers, you can tend to be you know, creative and you've got all these different amazing ideas. Don't put them all into the same grant, even if you think it's a great idea. Um, and I, I, noted, I noted this even just from previous submissions where, um, even for some of the, the larger network grants we submitted, didn't get funded on the first try, but when we just submitted just a sliver of it, that got funded. So just the imaging piece and just and it was very, very linear as possible. So it's like, there's no room for guessing, um, I found was kind of the key thing. Um, you can still do all the other cool things you wanna do once you get funded, but it just like, you, you just structure your grant based on the most linear, strongest idea that you have. And in the background, answer the why now question, because it, it has to be um, kind of hot in some ways. They don't tend to do like incremental, tiny things. It has to be a good question. And here we have him. <laughs> well, so sorry for being late. I, uh, I don't know why I, I couldn't uh, join. I'm sorry. I was a few minutes late and it transformed in being uh, nine minutes late, but in, anyway. Nice That's okay. We're happy you. to have you here. And I'm sure that Krista, you, I don't know why uh, you guys invited me. I don't think I'm a, I, I've been successful in getting grant, but I, there is no magic uh, expertise. And in my view, this is not a formal, uh, that you can buy books about how to write grant and with a, ch a chapter on each section of the grant and telling you, I, I did buy a book like that uh, maybe 30 some years ago. I've not looked at the book that exists now, but this is not a man, this is not a manual. It's more like some general philosophical thought. And I will try to be quick and then to address some section, some questions. So uh, uh, grant, okay, everybody want grant. And uh, on paper, it sounds like Mission Impossible, the 12, 15, per, we're going to talk of a CHR grant, but it would be not a, there are some additional steps if you want an NIMH grant, if you do a foundation, a brand Canada, so we're going to do a generic grant and pick CHR. So at a very high level, first, and I'm going to talk about what I see around me and people who get grant and people who don't. Uh, the people who get grant, and I had a mentor who was like a completely obsessional, start early. Okay? So there is a tradition in Canada of people starting a few weeks before the deadline and trying to cram. Uh, sometime you may get through, but in my opinion, it's an error. So if you, if you are serious about uh, getting a grant, 
let's say, uh, you know, as I say, my mentor would start two years before. It's a little bit too much, but at least six months before. And sometime you need two years. So, and then I was hearing uh, Chris start talking about, it has to start with an idea. You need to have an idea, a concept. And, and that concept, you need to have a passion with it because the worst thing that can happen to you in life is you get a grant about something you don't really want to do or you're not really interested or you're, you're not well positioned to do and the reviewer miss that and they give you the grant because then you are stuck for three or four years unless you're a very, very dishonest person. If you, and, and for CHR, you may get away, but for NIH, you wouldn't because they would monitor you. So you are stuck. For instance, if you have a passion for depression and you say there's a lot of money in Alzheimer and you send an Alzheimer grant and you get it, now you have to do study Alzheimer. And if you're not interested about Alzheimer disease, it's a pen in the neck. So you need to have an idea, something you're passionate. And then you need to say, I want to do that work and therefore I need some funding and I'm going to have a grant. There are no grant without pilot data. Okay. Different type of grant may require different type of pilot data. If you all want to ask the NIH for $10 million to study uh, 800 people, a pilot is really uh, a trial in 150 people that was randomized and that lasted three years. If you say, I want to do a feasibility study in 25 people to prove that something is doable over the next two years, small grant, um, then the pilot data may be uh, two patients. So, but you need pilot data. There are no grants without pilot data. And that's one reason if you don't have pilot data, it's uh, the time you go to REB, you get your REB application, you get your pilot data, you then analyze them. Ideally, you publish them or somewhere, then you write the grant, you submit, it's a year plus of work. That's why I'm saying some people start two years before the deadline because they do a solid pilot study. And if you say, well, but if the goal of getting grant is to get money to do some work, how am I going to do my pilot? You either beg uh, some friend and borrow or you do it yourself. So for instance, I did a grant with a junior faculty in our department and uh, she wanted to do something and and she and I said, well, you know, you're not impoverished. So she bought, you know, imagine you would want to do a grant with a tablet, you pay out of pocket, you spend $300, you buy the tablet, you give it to two patients and you do your small own pilot. She worked as her own RA, you get all your, all your rating and you do your two patients for eight weeks. And then you say, now I want a grant to do a 25 patient or 30 patient that I will follow for six months with that tablet. And so, so you need pilot data of some way. The pilot data doesn't, don't need to be completely the same. There are some fields, for instance, in pet study. If you tell me you have a tracer, I want to prove by existence. I want one human in Toronto went in the scanner with a tracer. But if you, if you tell me I do a grant and if I get the grant, we'll develop the tracer unless it's a grant specifically to develop tracer, I don't believe it. So if you say, I want to study uh, schizophrenia with a tracer, I want uh, at least one or two patients with schizophrenia who went in the scanner in Toronto with a tracer. So different grant. Uh, on the other hand, if you are doing uh, a task, you know, a cognitive task or a behavioral task, if you have done a study with another task that you developed, it may be okay not to have a pilot data for that specific new task that the grant is about, but you need pilot data, no pilot data, no grant. Okay. Reviewer and, and the, the Canadian hand waving, I'm in a big clinic, we have hundreds of patients per year, we'll have no problem recruiting. Uh, a guy like me will systematically uh, say, well, everybody said that it's not true. So if you, if you have a big clinic with 500 uh, people in the clinic with a diagnosis of interest, then I also want you to have done a chart review uh, and say we, we took a 50 of those charts, we apply your exclusion criteria and you find that uh, 10 of those 50 would have met uh, or exclusion and inclusion criteria. 
and we estimate 50 person would accept. So since we have 500 people in that clinic per year, we believe we will find uh, no problem, uh, you know, yeah, the same ratio, 100 will be eligible, 50 will accept uh, to sign, and therefore we believe it's okay for us to randomize four people per month for the next two years to get our sample of 100. So, I, you know, that's, that's another form of pilot data, feasibility pilot data, not just, oh, clinic do 500 consult uh, with people with bipolar disorder per year. Tell me, we took 50 of those consults, we did a chart review, we came up with that estimate. So you will look much more solid. So pilot data, an idea, pilot data, then the final thing, the writing of the grant. So now you are like uh, three months before the deadline, your pilot data are supportive of what you want to do. You have an innovative and interesting idea uh, that's feasible. Uh, I, I participate in an NIH workshop where we train uh, mid-career people to write grant. Uh, we spend all the workshop, 80% of the time on the aims and the hypothesis. Okay. So once you have your aims and hypothesis, the, the, the writing, the mechanic of you will recruit, you will do such and such scale and so on, uh, it's 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 secondary. You, that that's the cooking, and if you have a mentor or colleague, that's not the difficult part. The aims and hypotheses, which have to be linked to a conceptual model. Again, in the U.S., people accept to have a figure with box and arrow, a conceptual model of what are they testing with that grant. We emphasize this less in Canada. It's more implicit, but it's still there. My opinion is make your conceptual model explicit, explain what you're testing and why, and, and then the rest of your grant, the background section, the, the description of the method flow from there. But, but so if you're going to spend three months to prepare your grant after having your pilot, your idea and your pilot data and the pilot data are promising, you may want to spend a month obsessing on the aims and hypothesis. And then once you have the aims and hypothesis, you do the rest of the grant. And once you have done the grant, you come back and you're going to tweak your aims and hypothesis. There is an iterative process in writing a grant. And if you, if you, a, a fatal flaw in a grant is internal inconsistency. So you started the grant, you thought you were studying two group of 40 as you did your pilot and these things. You have changed your uh, power analysis and now you're going to do two group of 50, but in some place you're still talking of 40 or you have a phantom third group that doesn't exist anymore. When a reviewer like me sees something like that, uh, you have not worked enough. You're not going to be in the top 15%. You will never get that grant. So a grant is an exercise of obsessionality, but to make it doable, there is a kind of iterative process. When you have a solid M and hypothesis, you do the grant and then you restart and then you, you, the abstract and the title may change. So that, that you start with a placeholder, a title, you write your aims and hypothesis. And when I say an hypothesis, there is an introductory paragraph which summarizes the problem in one paragraph. The second paragraph is what you plan to do. Then you have the aims and the hypothesis and it's called specific aims and hypothesis. The aim have to be specific and it's not a general goal to improve the quality of care for X. Okay? And the hypothesis have to be testable. You give them to a biostatistician and they can design a statistical model to test your hypothesis. So, so the, the hypothesis about the scale. So when you, 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 it's not an hypothesis that people randomize to A will do better than people randomize to B is people will run on S2A will have a higher rate of a response operationalized at X based on scale Z. So you can give that over uh, 12 weeks uh, of treatment with intervention one versus intervention two. So the hypothesis have to be testable. And in terms of aims, again, that's uh, I, I said I will stop at some point for question and have more workshop type dialogue. So. Two fatal flaw is, uh, you know, if it's not interesting, uh, 
you will never get grant also to prove that something is bad. It's not interesting to, uh, when I say never, it's, you may be the exception, that, but you understand the reviewer are not going to be enthusiastic for you to do a study to prove that benzodiazepine hurt older people and make them fall and make them confused. It's not, you know, given if we had all the money in the world, that would be a great project given the limitation of funding. It's way more uh, caring for the reviewer to give you money to prove that uh, such and such intervention is wonderful and will help people rather than this intervention will hurt people. So, 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 you know, the fatal, the, the fatal, some fatal flaw is to have an idea that's too narrow, not exciting. The other side of the coin is you write a grant that's basically the, the work that your lab is going to do for the next 20 years. And that's not specific aims and you don't have testable hypothesis. You have a program of research for your career. And if that's, I see a lot of grant from beginner, they want to solve all the problem and it's too much. Of that, take a tiny little piece and make an entire grant of maybe a fifth or a tenth of that first grant that you want to do. It's not a grant, as I say, it's a career goal. So to finish, start early, uh, be focused, you need pilot data, uh, obsess uh, and do multiple iteration to write the grant, which is one reason you need to start early. The grant have to be, it's an exercise in perfection. Normally in life, we say it's good enough. That doesn't apply for grant because a good grant you will get at CHR or 3.8 and you will never get funded. And you want a 4.2 or 4.3 and to get a 4.2 or 4.3 people need to free and you need to convince three people. If you convince one or two of the three, your score through the magic of mathematics will go below. So you need to convince three people coming from different perspective that it was great. And again, so another, so a few things, collective intelligence, my, you know, you will be better off if you work with a grant with a group of colleagues and three average people will beat a genius in that game because they can give each other input and see something that's of use to somebody else and not to you. So it's a teamwork. It has to be a real team, not you do all the work and six other people put their name and don't give you any input. That's not going to help you. But if you want them to give input, you cannot go 10 days before. If somebody sent me a grant 10 days before the deadline saying, can they get my input? I will say no. Okay? If they talk to me three months before and we do a couple of iteration, uh, I will say yes. Okay? And so, so, so you have a team, those other people, act as your super ego, you help each other to meet deadline. <clears throat> there is a method and we can talk more about it. And again, th there was some that statistic published by the NIH, but I bet it's true also at CHR, about people, uh, some factor predicting that people being successful or unsuccessful in getting funded. The people who are successful in getting funded send less grant. So some people are desperate and they send three grants at each iteration. My opinion, it's an error. If you work on three grants, you may eventually get them, but it's going to get you three years and before you get your first one. If you work on one grant, you may get it in one year. So if you tell me I really want to get funded, I say pick one. Now, sometimes you can have two grants and yoke them. One grant for CHR, we have two competition per year. So you send one in a competition and then the next competition, you send the second one and then you review them and or revise them in order. So you may want to send to have two grants in play to juggle as junior people. If you are very senior, it's a different game. But if you are fairly junior, you are trying to get your first grant. If you are working on more than two grants, my opinion, you are hurting yourself. Anyway, I could continue with this little touch. I would rather stop and answer your question. We have Krista, another question to... too, right after this. I want to finish that point. The point I'm making is we are talking today narrowly about grant, but grant, publication, uh, 
networking, conference, those things do not take place in a vacuum. They are linked. And that's what uh, mentorship is about, is to help people to navigate those things now they enter, they enter it. There was a famous paper published in the Wall Street Journal called something like about my previous chair, David Kupfer was the editor of the DSM-5 chair, the number one 20 year in a row of most funding from NIH of any department in psychiatry in the US, so the University of Pittsburgh. So that guy, David Kupfer, they did a paper which actually was not nice, but was in the Wall Street journals called Pittsburgh Discover the Secret of Getting Grants, okay? And that was about that idea that grant do not take place in a vacuum. You can find it online or I can send it to you, have a seal of reprint or can send it to Krista, can send it to this group. The idea, it, it looks, the paper is very nasty, but there is a grain of truth that science, it's a human enterprise in a very specialized field of people who know each other and hopefully like each other and treat each other fairly. And at the end, you know, you're going to review the paper of your competition. They will review your paper. They will review your grant. Another saying from Kupfer linked to grant, I say grant and publication. He said, there is no problem in academia that cannot be uh, solved by a, good, a few good publications. So to give you a concrete example related to grant, again, I was working with a junior faculty member. She sent her grant and with, in my opinion, which was a good idea. Some of the reviewers said, what she's proposing is trivial. It has already been done several times. It's not interesting. And another group of reviewers said, what she's proposing is not doable and cannot be done. Okay. She came to me and she said, how do I solve that issue? You have reviewer that have the diametrical opposite view and you cannot do something that will satisfy both. I said, I told her about David Kupfer saying, and I say, you, are, you and I are going to write a systematic review of the topic. Okay. And we are going to say who is right. And what we found in the systematic review was that, uh, yes, some reviewers were right, uh, 12 or 15 team had tried to do what she wanted to do, but the other reviewer were right. All the people who had done it, had done it in a not great way and had the uh, average results. So then she repositioned her grant like, it is doable, but we need to do it the right way and I'm the right person now. And the fact that people tried 10 years ago and were not able to do it, we have made some progress, we should be able now to do it. And she got her grant. So that's an example of a paper. Yeah, I want to push more. If people tell you that something is not doable and doesn't exist like uh, epigenetics 20 years ago and it's, uh, it's uh, no, uh, scientific nonsense, if you really love your science, you bury yourself, you manage to find other funding, you do the work, you publish a paper in Nature or in Science or in Lancet about your finding, you come back, they will give you a grant, they will beg you. So uh, the doctor, uh, um, what's his name, or Russian epigeneticist, uh, I'm blocking on his name. It's not Pilkonis, it's- uh, Petronis. Petronis. Dr. Petronis, when he was young, early in his career, wanted to do epigenetics. The reviewer were keeping telling him, it's not possible, you are reinventing Lamarckism, it doesn't work. He was lucky enough to find some philanthropic fund. He did some work. 10 years later, the same people were begging him to submit grant and doing epigenetic of bipolar or Alzheimer or whatever. So, so sometime you need to do, if you really are too early for the field, some of you have heard me talk of the bleeding edge of the knife. You are bleeding, you are the one suffering. If you are too early, you are not going to get your grant. The, if you are too late, it's not interesting. There is a, the, 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 you know, the, the Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold. And you are at the leading edge. The leading edge there are for, for NIMH, not for CHR in Canada, but at NIH, if you are the first person wanting to do something that nobody else has done, you're probably too early. The ideal grant for NIMH is that a couple of NIDA or NITRIPLE, a couple of other team in North America are trying to do the same thing. And 
when people come and tell me I'm the only person doing this or the first or nobody has done it, one question as them is maybe it's because you're a genius or maybe it's because what you're doing is not interesting and not worth doing. So that the idea of being the leading edge versus the bleeding edge, the bleeding edge for grant doesn't pay. People claim they want innovation. It's not, they want some innovation. Too much innovation will hurt you. You have to do it through other mechanism, publish your data in great journal, then people will give you the grant. We have questions. And Benoit, yeah. Um, Chilla is asking, could you please comment on CIHR career grants? Um, she's oh, specifically please. asking about the new health system impact embedded ECS. Go away. So the, the, my, my experience, so I've not looked at the new one that they have. They used to have the early career. Uh, I work with uh, Tarek Raji uh, when he was a fellow to try to apply one, he get Turner. And, and by the way, I'm not really breaking confidentiality. The, all those are good uh, story that finished. So he apply as a fellow uh, and maybe a six or seven paper on his CV doesn't get it. We continue to work together. He reapply when he starts as an assistant professor with 15 paper, doesn't get it. He apply a third time and now he has 30 paper and he gets it and he gets promoted and he, uh, he has to, and he get a CHR, no, Canada researcher tier two, and he can keep the grant only for one year or two. So my experience in Canada with those career grant is they are, they are, they, they are not specialized for mental health. You're competing with the brightest cardiologists, oncologists, neurologists. No, you're reviewed not by people who are interested in brain and, and psychiatric disorder. And when they see some obscure schizophrenia versus cancer, and their mom or their aunt has cancer, those unconscious bias, I think they are very hard. I'm not saying not to apply for them, but they are very hard to get, very competitive. And, and, and in some sense, Tarek ended up getting his early career when he was no longer an early career, uh, when he had uh, published a lot. And I have seen that happening. So, so those, in a, in a paradoxical way, it's maybe easier uh, to get uh, your, your, your operating grant rather than those, those awards that look very good on paper. Uh, 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 same thing, Brain Canada has some, the foundation, you know, the Alzheimer Foundation, if you're going to do research in Alzheimer, uh, maybe a better shot. Uh, they, those, they are grant, for instance, the Alzheimer Foundation has grant for early career people and early career who are minority. So then once you have restricted the field and you're reviewed by people who have a passion, you're doing an Alzheimer grant reviewed by Alzheimer people, th th it's a better shot at it. The same way I see those University of Toronto grant and they say they will have three and people come and see me. I tend to avoid to say to my mentee, don't bother. You're going to compete with 300 people. It's too much a lottery ticket, you know, 10%, 12%, 15%, one chance out of six. It's, it's reasonable to compete. When you're talking of one chance in 100, uh, don't bother doing it unless you believe you are the perfect person, you have the perfect pilot data. And that's another thing I want to say about grant I forgot at a, at a generic high level. You write your first grant. The likelihood is wherever you submit it doesn't matter, you're not going to get it. But once you have written the first grant, you're going to shape that grant and resubmit it several times. And eventually it's going to be funded somewhere by somebody. So to give you an example, Tarek and I early, there was a Brain Canada competition. We wrote a big grant. We didn't get, we, we didn't even make the letter of intent stage. They, they turned us down. Then they had another competition a year later. We took the grant we had done the previous year. We changed it. We went through the letter of intent and then we got the grant. And it was one, there was uh, 30 people in Canada, they funded one. So it's one of the 3% grant, we got it. But we got it because the reality for us, it's not a 3%, it was something that we had done in, in a competition. We had thought about it for more than a year. We pre So it was a grant we had worked on for two years. I had another grant like that, I sent it to NIH, they did twice. 
They didn't give it to me. I came to Canada. We discussed uh, with uh, the government for a contract. They were very close to give it. They didn't give it to us. Then the Bell Canada did a competition. We got it funded. So that's a grant that had, by the time it was funded, it had been on my desk for 10 years. So I had an idea which I thought was powerful, should get funded. I'd written a grant. And, and that idea of shopping around your grant, you, once you write a grant once, once you have a good idea, those hypotheses, some pilot data, you, you are going to reshape it for various competition. Once you get a CHR grant, by the way, to go back to Dr. Kleinman question, certainly reshape it and send it to do a complementary grant at NIH. And if you get both, you're golden because you, you get your 450 from, uh, uh, from the CHR, your million point two from, uh, now you have a lot of money and you have five years and you can do really interesting work. And the grant in an unfair system again, and the data have shown it, it's an exponential system. It's a snowball system, rich get richer. The hardest grant to get is, is a, for, actually it may be the second one, the hardest, but the first couple of grants are very hard. Once you get two, three grant, you have a little machine, you generate data, you can get more grant. Uh, it's a rich get richer business. You could say it's unfair, but that's the way it works. So, so again, think once you get your CHR grant, you can probably transform it to get an NIH grant and, and get more money. And once you get those two grants, you can use all that money to get your next group of grants. Question, Krista, you, you read the, any other question or comment? I didn't see any other questions. I see people who probably have questions. So you don't have to use the chat. You can just jump in or you can put oh, one new message. At what point, maybe is it time to admit an idea won't get funded and give up? When to give up? I would say if you've applied, if you keep applying and answering the reviewer's comments, and your score never in, increases, it means that they just don't like the idea. You can also ask your colleagues to tell you honestly what they think about the idea. But I would say if you've gone three times and you keep answering comments and you just make up more stuff, it means they don't like the idea. Conversely, if you keep, that's a Canadian thing. In the US, you can submit twice and you have to restart that. So square zero. In Canada, there is no limit of the time you can resubmit. And if you keep progressing, because it's a Q system and there is still an issue of fairness. So the first time you get a 3.5, the second time you get a 3.8, the fourth time you get a 4.0, and then you go to a fourth time and you get a 4.1 and you are number eight and they found a seven, go back. And I've seen those people who actually write about this in the grant. They say, this is the fourth submission. The first time we got a 3.5 and we we're told to drop the, the control group, which we did, that we got a 3.8 and people ask us to add a cognitive assessment, which we did. We got a 4.0 then, and people are now asking us to do this. And then a guy like me look at this and say, we have to stop. We, you know, I, I will, you know, those conversations, I will say, we have to stop. And either we give them their grant or we don't, okay? And, and then they are, if there are enough people, and I say, that's why I decided stop the suffering. It's not a perfect grant, but I gave them a 4.3 because I don't want to see it again. And if there are enough people who are convinced by a guy like me, you will get your 4.2 and you get your grant. If conversely, there is one person in the group who say, but I think it's flawed. They want to do this. It's not doable. It will never work for this and that reason. Then everybody give you a 3.8 and you get back to what Krista is saying. Instead of progressing, as long as your score progress, keep going. But if your score are going backward, or if the first time you get a, a 3.9 and you say, oh, that's a pretty good score for, for submission. And then the second time you get a 3.5, the reviewer said, we want you to understand that we they, they are communicating with you through the score that, and by the way, there you go back to the Petroni story. 
if you are absolutely convinced that you are right and the rest of the world is wrong and miss it, you sit on that grant, you do other work, you publish paper, and, and then uh, you were the bleeding edge and five years later or 10 years later, you come back. I moved to North America in the early 1980s to do artificial intelligence in medicine. And after 10 years, I decided the work is not ready. I drop out from my PhD, take my master of science, and I'm going to become a clinical trialist. And then I did a fairly successful career as a clinician researcher. And now I'm the chair of a department. And in 2023, we can do uh, what in 1983, I probably, if you look at my CV, my first two papers were about artificial intelligence in medicine in the early 80s. My first, my master is an interdisciplinary master in artificial intelligence in medicine. But 40 years ago, the idea was good. The power didn't work. And now I'm too old, I'm not going back. But so do you understand what I'm saying? There, are, If you are, I was probably way too early, 40 years, too early, but somebody now wants to do an artificial an AI uh, machine learning system to diagnose this. I wrote a paper in the early 1980s to differentiate dementia from depression with a neural network. But And that was going to be a PhD thesis, which I did the qual and everything, and I drop out. And I'm glad because, but Jeff Hinton, you guys may know that name, was at Carnegie Mellon at the same time I was. He left, came to Canada, he never gave up. And 30 years later, he succeeded in his uh, translation. So if you truly tell me, it's like an impressionist painting in Paris in the 1860s. If you say, either I paint or I die, I say, okay, keep with your idea. If you say, you know what? I've tried three times to get them to find something about body dysmorphic disorder. They don't want to find it. I say, well, you know a lot about MRI and so on. Why don't you do something in an easier field of depression? You may do grant on depression. Once you are very successful, you have your lab. In 10 years, you may go back to your first love and do the body dysmorphic disorder. If I wanted to now, I could go back. It's too late for me, 40 years. I'm very happy to see uh, two generations later, people are going to do what I wanted to do 45 years ago. But so you, you understand what I'm saying? D give up, I agree with Krista, you give up, you do something else. That's the idea, by the way, to have two things and, and uh, to have I said, sending three or four grants is a bad idea, but having two ideas that you develop in parallel. And, and again, I've worked with June, some of you guys. One, and so they sent two grants, they didn't listen to me. One come back, discuss with a 3.9, the other as a 3.5. I said, we're going to put all our work in the resubmission of the 3.9. The 3.9 got funded. Now that person want to go back to the 3.5. So, so th there is a, you know, it's a marathon, you know, <laughs> your research career, you guys are very young. I gave you, uh, the, I cannot believe that I published my first paper uh, 40 years ago. So uh, it, it come by the way in PubMed, you can find it. If you look with the Molson artificial intelligence, I'm not making it up, but, but it's, uh, you know, and I'm not disappointed. I didn't fail my life. So remember, if you are smart and hardworking and honest, we are in a fairly good system that's fair. It's not perfect, but it's fair enough. You will all be professor one day and you will have a lab and you will be funded. Is it going to take you? And, and by the way, the people who took, who tell me, took me five or 10 years to get my first grant, they were doing something wrong. And one thing they were doing wrong, either they didn't have a mentor or my impression in, in our department where we're a big department, there are a lot of good mentors for all of you. You're not listening to your mentor. I have, that, that's my own, I said to people, if you send four grant, it's going to get you three years to get your first grant. They keep sending four grant, two to three grant at every competition none of the grant is good enough to be funded. If they had put all the effort on one or two, they will already be funded. But that's their life, that's not mine. I'm not an oppressor. So so anyway, it was a pleasure talking with you. Good Thank luck. you very much, Benoit. Thanks to everyone for coming. And uh, you can also submit questions afterwards that we can forward. So thanks everyone. Good luck.
and so um, on for joining. We have leadership seminars coming up that you'll see announcements about with uh, an external consultant. So May 31st will be the first leadership training that we're going to be doing. We have a facilitator coming in. So we're really excited about that. So yeah. we'll tell you more about that in the coming weeks. Thanks, everyone. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Bye.